using presenter mode. Yes. Let's see here. You need to go to display settings on the top and, and take uh, one of the options there. Now. Perfect. Cool. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. I'm really excited to tell you about my latest work. And so, the what I'll be talking about today is exploring the post-translational enzymology of PAA by mRNA display. And so, the the goal of what I've been trying to work on for the last couple of years is essentially to harness the, the power of peptide libraries, um, specifically um, in an mRNA display fashion. Uh, one to uh, steady peptide modifying enzymes uh, in the hopes to develop essentially promiscuous peptide lab catalysts. Um, and why we want to do that is essentially to develop a toolbox of enzymes that we can use um, to develop highly modified peptide libraries for inhibitor discovery um, based on where, so we're in the um, Department of Pharmacy and so we want to uh, essentially, you know, discover chemical probes and, and drugs and so we think enzymes would be a good way to, to modify libraries to find those. And so what is mRNA display? So mRNA display at its core is a method to generate large libraries of peptides and then to tag them um, with their own encoded RNA, which gives them a barcode. And so how this works is you can take a library of RNAs and fix a, a, a natural product of your mice into it. You give that RNA to the ribosome. The ribosome will translate the uh, encoded peptide and then it stalls at a design point. At that point, the pure myosin molecule can actually enter into the ribosome and connect the RNA to the peptide, giving it its, um, effectively we say genotype to phenotype, or essentially giving each peptide a barcode. And so you can actually incorporate unnatural amino acids into your libraries um, to make these cyclic peptides, which is um, very typically done these days. And then how most people treat these libraries is to apply a target of interest and to just search for peptides which bind that target. Like I'm showing here, so you can add your enzyme, peptides that don't bind, you wash away, and then peptides that do bind, you can keep, and then you can sequence the RNA tag, and then lo and behold, you'll have your um, newly discovered inhibitor. And so this is a really um, cool and really powerful technique that people are using. Um, but like I mentioned, I'm interested in enzyme reactions, and specifically enzyme reactions that are performed on peptides. And so we thought, well, maybe we can actually rework this assay um, to study an enzyme. So we asked this question, can mRNA display be used to study an enzyme reaction? So the process would be much the same, um, at least to create the RNA peptide libraries. Um, but instead of designing this library to bind a specific enzyme target or like a, an enzyme that you might want to inhibit, we can actually design these peptide RNA libraries to be substrate for a specific peptide modifying enzyme. So then we could make the library, add the enzyme that we want to study. That enzyme might um, modify some of the peptides in that library. And then through a clever selection process, we could actually maybe pull out um, only modified substrates and then wash away the non-modified ones. And then we could actually measure the enzyme activity based on um, next generation sequencing, which would be a really nice way to, and high throughput way to study an enzyme. And so the enzymes that we're particularly interested in are called RIPs, or ribosomally synthesized and post translationally modified peptides. And so these are um, an interesting class of natural products in that um, the biosynthesis begins with the expression of a small um, structural gene. And the structural gene, once it's expressed, is called a, a precursor peptide which can be broken down into um, two parts, essentially a core sequence, which will eventually become the small molecule natural product. And then also it has um, the concatenation of recognition sequences. And so what we know now is that these recognition sequences actually program different enzymes within the biosynthetic uh, pathway to install chemistries into the core sequence. And then once the core sequences is uh, completely modified, the recognition sequences are cleaved away to reveal the mature natural product. And so um, this 
uh, separation between recognition and modification uh, is fairly unique to uh, RIP biosynthesis. And it's probably best um, exemplified or best described um, in this crystal structure of, of LIN-D. So LIN-D is an enzyme that is part of the uh, cyanobactin biosynthesis. And it's, a it's part of a class of enzymes that take cysteines, threonines, and serines and turn them into azolanes through ATP backbone activation. And so in the crystal structure I'm showing you here, the blue is the catalytic domain. And then this orange domain up here is called a RIP recognition element. And so what we've found, or uh, what has been uh, noted, is that this RRE domain is actually found very widespread in a lot of RIP enzymes. So it's paired with a lot of different uh, catalytic domains. And what's been found about this domain is that this domain is actually what's responsible for binding the recognition sequences within the, the structural genes. And so, for instance, this recognition sequence would bind uh, the orange domain, this pins the peptide to the enzyme, and then positions the core sequences for uh, modification by the catalytic domain. And so because there's a separation between um, substrate recognition and substrate modification, these enzymes tend to be very highly promiscuous. And so because of that, we think that they would be good biocatalysts for peptide library modification. And so like I mentioned, there's actually a lot of different RIPs out there that we don't know anything about. This is probably one of the, the best studied ones, um, but we're interested in a lot of the other different catalytic domains that are out there because we think that their chemistries are interesting. And so we'd like to develop a tool to be able to quickly study RIPs or right, these types of enzymes. And there's, there's always two questions you ask right away when you're studying a new RIP, and that is, what is this recognition motif? And how mutable is, is the core? And so as we decided to uh, set up mRNA display as a tool to study RIPs, we turned to a model RIP system in pantosin A. So pantosin A is this small molecule here. It's an antibiotic. Um, apple farmers uh, use this actually to treat fire blight. So this is an, an important antibiotic. And it's also a RIP. So I'm showing you here the biosynthetic gene cluster. Uh, PAAP here is the structural gene, the amino acid sequence I'm showing you here. And the core of this RIP is this EEN motif, which will eventually become this small molecule. And so for the rest of the talk here, we'll actually just zoom in on one of these uh, genes, this is PAAA. And this enzyme is responsible for taking this peptide substrate and transforming the two glutamic acids, E16 and E17, into the bicyclic scaffold of pantosin A. Uh, through a pretty complex reaction, two dehydrations and a decarboxylation. So if we also look at the crystal structure of this enzyme, we know that it has an RRE domain, um, like we saw in LIN-D. And so we think that this uh, domain is probably responsible for binding um, this peptide, either in the leader or the follower. So this is a uh, kind of a unique grip in that it's got recognition sequences on the front and the back of the core. And so we set off to um, develop an assay, which would allow us to measure um, basically two questions. Um, which substrate residues are binding PAA, and then can PAA uh, make new pantosin and analogs in the hopes of making potentially new antibiotics in the future. And so we, de we designed this, this assay uh, where we could do MR mRNA display to make PAA substrates. Uh, we would use a natural amino acid incorporation to put a biotin on the front. This is an affinity handle. And then on the C terminus, we'd have this, the, the RNA tag based on the RNA, uh, mRNA display protocol. We treat with PAA and install our uh, uh, eye cycle here. And then if we give the enzyme, let's say a library of mutations, some of those mutations might actually kill the reaction, which would leave these glutamic acids unmodified. And so what we can do actually to separate, you know, cyclic versus non-cyclic substrates, so we can treat with a protease, this is GLU-C. And so GLU-C cleaves very non-specifically at glutamic acid residues. So upon treatment of this enzyme, um, if the substrate is unmodified, the biotin affinity tag will be removed from the RNA bar barcode. And then by simple streptavidin enrichment, we can actually selectively pull out our modified substrates. And then by qPCR and next generation sequencing, we can calculate these enrichment scores and map out um, how well a different mutant does compared to the wild type. Um, and where uh, in the heat map that we'll be looking at, orange is a mutation that performs better than the wild type, gray performs as well as wild type, and then blue worse than the wild type. And so um, just to make sure that this assay was working, we just displayed 
um, a wild type gene that we knew PA was working on just to make sure that it could take the N terminal biotin and the C terminal RNA tag. These are pretty significant modifications. But if we run the assay, which I just described, and then measure streptavidin recovery of uh, this product, we see that it's dependent on PAA concentration. And it's also dependent on PA the time uh, incub of incubation with PAA. So this just showed us that the assay was working properly. And so we went off and, and uh, purchased a library, um, which I'm showing you here. This is a single variant library where each of the different positions underneath this bar had been mutated singly, ran it through our assay, and then mapped that as a heat map, um, where the top here is the wild type sequence, and then on the bottom here are the different mutations which we were able to probe. So a couple of things that we noticed right away. Um, first, you can see this blue bar. This is glutamic acid mutations all along the leader and the follower. And so this is an important control in our assay to make sure that our glucy selection was working properly. And so what we can see is that if we make a glutamic acid mutation, say at position one, um, irrespective of modification here, we're getting cleavage, and that's a scar basically from the selection protocol. Um, so this just told us that the selection was working well. Second thing we noticed is that a lot of these positions that we tried to mutate actually didn't seem to affect the reaction very much. So PA is actually very, very tolerant of single mutations, specifically in the follower sequence. Um, alternatively, we found that four positions in the leader, F4, L7, R10, and I11, perform consistently poorly when mutated. So we think that these are probably the residues that make up the recognition motif for binding between the substrate and the enzyme. Also, we noticed this was kind of fortuitous. We didn't expect this, but we actually see differential processing between the two core glutamic acid mutations. And so I'll get into a little bit about more mechanistically about that, but that gives us insight into the reaction mechanism, which I'll describe. And then finally, if we look at the only other residue in the core, this end position also looks very tolerant to mutations, suggesting that maybe we can make new pantose A uh, analogs. And so to confirm these hypotheses from the data, we first looked at these four residues, if they're important for, for binding. And so to do this, I synthesized several different peptides um, with aspartic acid mutations at each of the different positions, um, including a wild type and a wild type tamer labeled, and then a control aspartic acid mutation right in the middle of that motif, um, which was predicted actually to not be important for binding. And so uh, in a competitive fluorescence polarization assay, what we end up finding is that the wild type sequence is able to bind, as well as the control T6D is able to bind. We're actually not able to measure uh, a competitive binding with these other mutants, suggesting that they're not, um, that they are no longer able to bind. And we can also confirm this by isothermal calorimetry and calculate KDs for the wild type and T16 mutants where the other mutants failed to produce binding curves. Um, just uh, further demonstrating that these residues are in fact important for binding. Um, alternatively, so I mentioned that we could get insights into the reaction mechanism of PAA. So before showing you again the heat map, I want to just go over what I mean by that. So you can draw the reaction arrows for the reaction that PA is catalyzing in two different ways. So if we follow the red arrows, uh, you could imagine E16 activation by PAA and then cyclization to a six-member image, then Claisen condensation and decarboxylation. Or alternatively, you could follow the blue arrows where E17 might be activated um, to form this five-membered image and then decarboxylation, or Claisen condensation and decarboxylation. And so what does our, our data say? And so if we look back at the heat map, and we look at E16 modification, that's this position here, we see that it's very blue, suggesting that this glutamic acid is available for glue C cleavage, meaning that it's unmodified. Alternatively, if we look at E17, we see that it's protected from glue C. And so what that is suggestive is that the six-membered image has been formed. Um, and so that would actually be suggestive of these red arrows. And so what's really nice about this is that there's actually a very key distinction between the two arrows, the red and the blue, and that is which residue is getting decarboxylated, either E17 or E16. And so to confirm um, the cyclization pattern, um, synthesize this peptide by native chemical ligation, where glutamic acid uh, E17 was uh, selectively labeled with heavy atoms. And so um, in this case, uh, the carboxyl carbon of E17 has a C13 label. And so if we run this assay, we'll actually see a shift of minus 81 Daltons if E17 is in fact decarboxylated rather than uh, 80. And so we can run this assay and um, here's the product from the NCL reaction. I treat with PAA and we see that uh, disappear. 
and then a new peak grows in, and that peak is in fact um, 81, a shift of 81 Beltons, confirming that E17 is in fact decarboxylated. Uh, and then finally, just to show that um, BAA can make new precursors to pentose and A analogs, so potentially leading to new antibiotics in the future, um, we can translate this peptide, treat it with PAA, and then even after, this is just a 22 minute reaction, we see the, the product being formed, which is here, which is just a few reactions away from uh, new, anti uh, new pentose and A analogs. And so finally, um, what we were able to do is we can show now that RIPs are compatible with mRNA display. We were able to take a library of substrates and then measure enzyme activity. And what we were able to learn um, from this RIP enzyme are mechanicus, mechanistic insights, um, RIP binding insights, and as well as show that we can make new pentose and A precursors. And so we believe other RIPs are going to be compatible with this strategy. Um, we have methods now to measure RNA peptide library modification, um, which we find to be very useful. And what we're doing now is we are developing biocatalysts for peptide library modification. So this would be step two of what I mentioned in the first slide. And once we have this toolbox filled out, um, we'll pump it back into mRNA display so we could develop libraries of you know, highly complex, highly modified peptide libraries so we can do uh, discovery of natural product-like inhibitors um, to develop chemical probes and hopefully drugs. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone in the, the lab, makes coming to lab uh, super fun every day, um, as well as internal collaborators and committee members. Um, and then a, a huge thanks to our external collaborators in Tokyo um, and Dr. Suga's lab, who have been um, very instrumental in teaching me how to run an mRNA display. Um, and then these are our funding sources, which um, allowed all this to be possible. And so uh, with that, I'll try to answer any questions that anyone might have as best as possible. Anthony, you muted. I have to do it at least once. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Stephen, for fantastic talk. Really great results there. Um, yeah, and, and you, can you mediate the session? Sure, yeah, very impressive, uh, very impressive work and, and fascinating enzyme. Uh, I have a question re regarding uh, the, the leader sequence and, uh, and uh, would, you, would you imagine using your assay to evolve your, uh, the enzyme away from that leader recognition sequence? The, sorry, that kind of broke up actually. I didn't actually get the full question. Do you mind repeating? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask uh, if you could imagine evolving the enzyme away from the leader recognition system, so uh, sequence, so that uh, that uh, it actually was some shorter peptides in, and can you potentially remove this whole uh, recognition mo module? Hmm, um, it's an interesting question. That I think moving it away from the leader peptide recognition might be difficult. So sometimes um, you can run the reactions with just the cores and you get a slight modification. So I guess it's possible maybe with enzyme um, uh, uh, mutagenesis, you might be able to evolve a better enzyme that could work on just the core. Um, but I guess what we find is that we kind of like having the leader peptide motif because then we can program how that enzyme is acting and which it kind of like is a little tag that says act here. Um, so we kind of like it, but I guess theoretically, maybe it would be possible to evolve the enzyme away from it. Thank you. Are there any other questions for, uh, for Steve? Yeah, I had a quick one. Um, so right now it looks like your methodology relies on having a selective protease for your unprocessed peptide. Um, are there any other methodologies you're thinking about that don't rely on using a protease to cleave off a biotin tagged and terminal end? Like, are yeah. there other ways of pulling out processed or unprocessed peptides from your library? Yeah, we, we really like uh, proteases because a lot of you can just buy from NEB and these types of things and uh, a lot of reactive groups you can use proteases for or whatever. Um, but there are other methods. So for instance, um, uh, I guess can you, you can still see my, my screen, right? So enzyme Lin D, right? This takes cysteines and turns them into thiazolines. And so some of the things that we've tossed around is like a subtractive type of purification. So you might run this reaction, you create the thiazoline, and then you can just buy resin 
that reacts with um, free thiols, um, which would, that would be a way to separate as well. Um, so, yeah.